Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this discussion. Uh, really fascinating uh, thoughts from my co-panelists, and I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing much more of the questions. Um, so this is the first slide. So um, I'm going to be talking uh, not as an art or cultural historian or an artist, but um, as a writer and journalist who's been thinking and, and discussing and writing about these issues for some years now. And, and really understanding how, whilst there's a really interesting and important body of scholarship um, around post-colonial studies and so on, how is this uh, discourse, how is this narrative actually being experienced um, in popular culture and, and by ordinary people um, in their day-to-day -day lives and day-to-day -day interactions? So the discussion surrounding the concept of decolonization and its associated movement, particularly in Western societies, has gained a, a lot of prominence over the last decade but particularly accelerated, at least in the UK um, and America, uh, following uh, the uh, uh, infamous uh, murder of George Floyd um, at the hands of a police officer in 2020. And I think, you know, this movement, um, as has been outlined, ostensibly uh, argues that it is trying to uh, in improve uh, society, reduce inequality, address historical uh, injustices, particularly um, committed by Western countries. So the transatlantic slave trade, colonialism, imperialism, very uh, hugely influential parts of history and very important to look at. But it says that it is uh, trying to uh, redress historical injustices by deconstructing and subverting Converting the supposed racist colonial origins of, of many aspects of social, cultural, and political life. And this movement is having a huge impact on, on the arts and cultural sector um, in the UK and beyond, and is raising some really important and legitimate questions, such as how should we understand the past, morality and judgment, the boundaries of artistic freedom and, and expression. So to understand the uh, tensions and challenges within this discussion, I think it's really important and crucial that we first establish the definitions. So colonialism, I think, as is widely understood for most people, is where one country or, or group of countries or empire um, control a particular people or territory by establishing colonies, taking over the governance, the economic and political life of a particular context. And therefore, in that understanding to decolonize refers to the removal um, of a foreign power, uh, a foreign ruling power. However, contemporary uh, discussions of decolonization, I would argue, is very different, and it differs from uh, the, the previous understanding. What is talked about um, in the discourse now is an attempt to eliminate any remnants of cultural, uh, social, or moral knowledge or customs perceived to have foreign origins, often associated with, at least uh, in the UK and America, with supposed white Western origins. Whilst connected, I think it presents a very significant departure from previous understandings, and, and actually that has very significant implications. I would argue that formal decolonization represents political and economic agency, self-governance, self-determination, and is involved in reclaiming one's own destiny of their nation and, and directing it in a particular direction. Whereas the latter, I think, is something different. I would argue that it actually has a, almost an anti-human element as it seeks to disregard or disrupt the continual uh, human process of creating and reshaping culture, often seeking to define certain expressions, ideas, philosophies, and ways um, of being as in distinctly oppositional racial terms. And I think, I don't want to uh, sound one-sided. I think there is nuance in this, this discussion. So. If we just go on to the next slide. I don't know if people know who uh, this, this woman is. This is uh, a famous uh, supermodel called Naomi Campbell. And one of the things that's very interesting is, uh, is a movement that I was really uh, uh, looking into uh, in, in the early 2010s. It's called the Natural Hair Movement. And it um, emerged in the mid-20th century in the 1960s in America, um, but really uh, regained prominence again um, in the early 2010s and, and, and the late 2000s. And it was essentially a movement of uh, particularly women of African heritage who uh, were trying to push back on representations of uh, African origin features and African hairs as inferior and, and ugly in many ways. And many of these women, uh, uh, quite organically, quite grassroots, uh, rejected that and sought to uh, wear their hair in its natural way without straightening it and embracing and subverting um, certain uh, understandings from racism uh, to, to depict and to reflect the real beauty of African features. I think 
one of the things that's quite difficult in this discussion is to differentiate from what I would argue are very uh, important and, uh, and very great ways in which previously uh, victimized uh, minorities uh, seek to reclaim uh, wrong and inappropriate and negative representations, which, what I, which um, between what I think is happening now, which is something very different. This movement is much more about individual empowerment, um, whereas I would argue that uh, the decolonizing discourse that we have now is actually reinforcing um, certain assumptions that perhaps uh, this movement was trying to reject. So I'm just going to uh, go into that a, a bit deeper. So the first problem, the first contention I have with the discourse um, around decolonization and its impact in wider society is actually far from uh, bringing to light uh, minority perspectives that were historically marginalized. Actually, oftentimes, it erases history and erases uh, historical complexity by uh, simplifying the past and presenting a one-sided idea of colonialism as purely an oppressive force, neglecting the complex interactions, collaborations, and conflicts that occurred in the colonial period. And I think an example that really represents this um, is a portrait by uh, somebody called Ayuba Suleiman Diallo um, at the National Portrait Gallery, and as a trustee, something that I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, so he was uh, around uh, in the 18th century, and he was a prominent uh, Muslim prince from West Africa, from the uh, Fulani tribe, and he was kidnapped and trafficked to the Americas during the transatlantic slave trade. Interestingly, and I think this is a really important detail, having previously owned and sold slaves uh, himself, and what's really quite astonishing about his sto story, after his supporters uh, helped him gain freedom, he actually returned to Africa in 1738 to work for the Royal Africa Company, um, which was a company during the British Empire, which was uh, involved in uh, a lot of harmful practices. And, uh, he was, uh, and it was also active in the slave trade, and he worked for that company for the rest of his life. And so I think this is just one example, and there are many others, but I think this is just one example of when we think about things through the lens of this decolonizing discourse, we can actually miss the complexities of many historical figures. How, can we really understand him as um, through a solely a oppressor versus oppressed lens? Where does he fit in um, in these stories? And I think oftentimes when we look at things through this discussion, we actually overlook uh, the different uh, ethnic minorities and white like, stories from the global south that don't neatly fit into uh, this particular narrative. So one of my uh, primary uh, can, uh, problems with the discourse is how, as I said, it uh, erases historical memory and deprives us of a nuanced understanding of our own history, which is actually a very rich source of meaning and identity. And it was just talked about uh, some theories about uh, the origins of woke or why it exists is actually a, a new religion. Um, and oftentimes, that the old stories, the old places of meaning that we can take from are, are actually rich sources of meaning without needing to uh, create new religions and so on. So I think it fails to acknowledge uh, diverse experiences and perspectives from, from both the colonized um, and those doing the colonizing. And then my second uh, problem with it is I think uh, it attacks moral judgment. So by categorizing historical figures and actions solely through modern or contemporary ethical lenses, we impose present-day moral standards on individuals and societies from the past, often leading to overly harsh criticism and condemnation. Whilst it's, of course, essential to analyze and assess historical injustice, this approach can, again, undermine a more nuanced evaluation of the moral complexities and evolving ethical standards of different time periods. And so I want to point to another controversy that's uh, what happened in the UK. Um, so this is a uh, controversy over an exhibition, a Hogarth exhibition, uh, which was at the Tate Britain um, in London. And the Telegraph, which is a, uh, a conservative newspaper, wrote, William Hogarth is an artist uh, known for his satirical depictions of the 18th century, never more so than his images of drunken debauchery. But an exhibition at Tate Britain has suggested that his pictures are no laughing matter because their subjects are drunk on the spoils of slavery. And so a woman uh, called Sonia Barrett, a visual artist and sculptor, uh, who uses 18th century furniture in her work, um, had commentary to accompany uh, some of the pictures in the exhibition. And one of the commentaries said, 
The chair is made from timbers shipped from the colonies via routes which also shipped enslaved people. Could the chair also stand in for all those unnamed black and brown people, enabling the society that supports his vigorous creativity? So I think this is just an example of uh, something that, uh, it, the reason I would argue that this is attacking moral judgment is because it's actually preventing people from uh, enjoying that artwork, coming to their own conclusions, and is in, uh, drenching it in a particularly contemporary uh, moral understanding. And not just the modern contemporary understanding, but one that's actually usually from a very specific area of the political spectrum. So there's a lot of political ideology um, that is... Uh, really gatekeeping and preventing uh, members of the public from being able to come to their own conclusion. And is essentially suggesting, well, we cannot really enjoy a humor or, or, or things that happened uh, several hundred years ago because all of it must be tainted, all of it uh, must be uh, infused with uh, the, the evil of colonialism and the evil of that period. And I, th I think there's something deeply anti-democratic about that. I think that's deeply uh, anti-human. Um, and I think that it actually makes us estranged, makes, makes us distant um, from our past because it means that uh, the past is this place of, of, of evil um, and there's nothing about that that we can take from, we can learn from, we can really appreciate, we can only uh, stay in the present. So I think that this, another example, uh, just to highlight this point a, a little further, um, and this is a quite a complicated uh, historical example, but this is a debate going on in, in Britain at the moment, and it's also about the return of the Benin Bronzes. So uh, the Benin Bronzes are a series of brass uh, plaques looted, and they were looted by the British in uh, 1897 from modern-day Nigeria, many of which are now um, on display in the British Museum. But actually what is uh, the, the discussion is about that we, we looted these things and that we should return it. But I think one of the problems is what is not actually discussed is um, the, the, the empire where the Benin bronzes were created were also grew, grew rich from the transatlantic slave trade and actually just trading um, African slaves. So it really does raise questions that um, are they an example of a kind of great uh, African civilization uh, and should be, they be returned or are they also a product of, of uh, violence and slavery uh, and uh, subjugation from the society itself? And again, in the UK, it's very difficult to have those kinds of nuanced discussions and to hear the different ranges of perspectives that actually don't always paint uh, Europe as the sole um, instigator of evil actions. And I think one of the problems is, in the name of uh, uh, challenging supposed white supremacy, um, what we do is actually create a new form of uh, white Eurocentrism, which says that all of the problems, all of the bad things of the world are solely a product of a singular area, and all of the other parts of the world are, are just victims. And, and I think that, that that actually undermines human agency, and I think um, that actually raises the status um, of Western Europeans, I think, perhaps beyond uh, what I think is actually appropriate. And so I think that the next thing that I want to just talk about is a, a more light-hearted uh, discussion. And I think one of the things that, the last problem that I want to just talk about is that I think one of the, the decolonizing discourse uh, oversimplifies identities. It reduces individuals and cultures to fixed monolithic categories. And this essentialism can hinder efforts to acknowledge the diverse experiences and identities within communities, thus often perpetuating stereotypes and divisive thinking. And it often might inadvertently marginalize those identities um, that don't actually fit into predefined categories. Um, so just take this example very quickly. I don't know if people know who this woman is. She's a, a very famous uh, British singer called Adele. Um, and she is at a carnival uh, called Notting Hill Carnival, which was uh, founded in the UK um, in the mid-20th century um, when there was a large influx of uh, people uh, from the Caribbean who are British. And uh, this festival was created in order to celebrate West Indian culture and to integrate uh, white British people with uh, the, the Caribbean and, and other diverse communities that existed in London at the time. She was uh, born and raised in London. She's been uh, raised in a very uh, multicultural uh, community. And she was criticized very strongly by certain uh, activists online um, in the name of 
the decolonizing discourse. So she's got um, a particular hairstyle, which is an African-inspired hairstyle called Bantu Knots, and she's got the Jamaican flag on, on her bikini and just dressed in a general carnival way. And many people said that this was a form of something called cultural appropriation. Um, essentially, this idea that um, people from dominant cultures um, should not uh, embrace or should not wear or should not um, represent themselves by minority cultures because that's essentially a form of stealing and disrespecting of that culture. And actually, to me, I think it's the exact opposite. Um, I think that this is a really beautiful example of um, collaboration, exchange, cultures mixing, and creating new things that, um, uh, that weren't there before. I think this is the real kind of concrete impacts, I think, um, regardless of some of the positive intentions and some of the origins. It actually, uh, what it often does is uh, reduce the freedom of individuals to experiment, to explore, uh, to exercise their agency, and to reinvent themselves. And I think it can have a very patronizing aspect, but also um, could undermine the, the fundamental creative spirit. And just one more example, uh, very quickly. Um, this is, uh, this photo over here um, is from uh, a, a religious community in South America, particularly in Cuba called Santeria. And uh, it emerged um, following the transatlantic slave trade, and the photo over there is influenced by two religions in particular. One is, again, uh, an indigenous religion from Nigeria called Ifad Divination, which is a kind of spiritual, animistic, uh, and polytheistic type of a, a religion. And then the second one is Catholicism. And that during, following the transatlantic slave trade, many of the, the, uh, the former slaves and their descendants actually still kept elements of this indigenous West African religion, but also embraced many aspects of Catholicism. And to me, this is, this is another example of actually uh, how the, the decolonial narrative, it is, it's hard to really, un it can't understand these kinds of examples because, that, because it's actually created something new, bringing in uh, Western origin cultures and, and ideas, but also uh, fusing it with um, other cultures to create something quite exciting. So just to bring it back round to um, the question of whether or not this applies to Central and Eastern European countries, I would argue that in many ways it doesn't apply to Western countries, even though they're the, the ones that are uh, perpetuating it across the world. And while, whilst it might look like this is a dominant uh, conversation, uh, within uh, America and within the UK, there's, it, it's actually, there's many people disagreeing, there's a very live debate going on. And so the question of whether or not it applies to Western countries is I think just as important. And I, I would argue that um, it doesn't fit very neatly in Western countries, let alone um, Eastern European countries. So the crux of my point is that there are better ways to um, morally understand the past. And I think that um, here we should think critically um, and, and view it with skepticism uh, when we are embracing uh, the decolonizing discourse. Thank you. In order to achieve uh, racial equality in a liberal democracy, for me, the first thing we have to do is actually to define racial equality properly.